I'm Sil Rivera, and you're watching the Disney Channel. Dun, 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 dun. Well, not really. In fact, what you're watching is my channel, Soul Food, and today I will be doing part two of my Book in the Neat series. Now, if you're new to the channel or simply forgot from what feels like forever ago since I last posted, a Book in the Neat series is where I read a book and make a meal from all 196 countries on our planet. Now, if you guys want further explanation, I will post the video either here or here, so you can click on that for further explanation. Now, before you go though, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe on this one. And thank you guys so much for a thousand subscribers. It really means a lot. So now, I will be talking about our country of the week, which is Albania. Albania. The country of, well... What is the country of? I mean, Albania is pretty relatively unknown to the majority of the Western world. Albania is a country with a population of 2.83 million people. It is located in Southern Europe and people who live in Albania are called Albanians. As always, I got this information by the CIA World Factbook. It's a free resource and super easy to use. And because of this, and because of the book that I read for this, titled Broken April by Ismaili Kadare, I will be discussing mostly about the Albanian tribal people. However, before we get into that, I want to make a point saying that not everyone in Albania is a member of one of these tribes or follows the code that I will be getting into later in this video. Just know, keep an open mind, not everyone in Albania is categorized by this one book I read by this one author that was written in the mid 20th century. Albania is a diverse culture with thousands of years of history dating all the way back to the Roman Empire and I encourage all of you guys to check more of its really awesome history on your own time. But before you do that, please watch my book review of Broken April by Ismail Kadare. So while many of you may not know who Ismail Kadare is, he's actually the most famous Albanian author to ever come from Albania, really. He is one of the best resources to learn about this country's tumultuous past, culture, and mentality. He was so prolific that when Albania was under the communist regime, he would sneak out his manuscripts to his French publicist, who would then share them with the entirety of the world. And this really sets the tone for the book I will be talking about today. So, in Broken April, Kadori writes about one of the most peculiar and specific parts of Albanian culture the feudal set of laws, the canoon and its terrible vendetta rules. Jock Marja, I'm sorry, I'm really bad at pronunciation of these Albanian words, especially because Albanian is a phonetic language and it's really complicated for me to do stuff with that. So in this book, we focus on three main characters. However, there's a bunch of different point of views within this novel. These three main characters are Jorg, Bessian, and his wife, Diana. So at the beginning of the novel, we focus on one of these village people named Jorg. And what he's recently done is avenge his brother's death. Now, most of you, or I hope all of you are thinking, wow, murder, uncool. However, according to this set of Albanian tribal people and according to Kanun or code in our language of English, uh, avenging blood feuds are just a totally normal part of the culture. So let's say one was to, you know, harm one's family member, it would be a quid pro quo type deal. And I couldn't help thinking of the famous saying, if everyone took an eye for an eye, the entire world would be blind. And I totally forgot who said that, but it really sets the tone for this entire book. Now, because of the grim topic that this novel especially deals with, you know, blood 
and revenge and killing in this endless cycle of death and destruction, it makes sense that this book has a really gloomy overtone throughout it all. And it really does. The entire time you feel like you're in this misty space, even though Albania is a Mediterranean country and doesn't have loads of cold, rainy weather, as this book describes. It's more of a fantasy land of what the Kanun makes these Albania mountains, this high plateau, into. This desolate place that's only built on the function of bloodshed. So moving on, in the novel, Jor kills his brother's murderer and is waiting to be hunted down by the dead man's family. He has to perform all the necessary preparations for the vendetta to continue its bloody course, including a walk to a distant village to play a blood tax to the region's ruling family. And this ruling family, we'll get into it in a little bit. There's a lot of stuff going on here. So the other point of view that I mentioned are Bessian and Diana who are on their honeymoon. And since the husband makes a living writing about the canoon, he proposed to visit the remote mountain villages where the laws are most prevalent. So although at the beginning the couple is close, these horrors that the canoon reveals to Bessian and especially Diana really shows really shows to draw cracks within this marriage that is revealed to be founded on way more shaky foundations than what you're originally taught to believe. So again, I'm going to focus on this a lot, especially the role of Diana within this novel. Now, obviously, as you guys might have suspected, Albanian tribal culture isn't exactly the most modern of all cultures, and that definitely applies to their viewpoint on women. And especially within the entire novel, even with Bessian, who is supposedly a modern man, Diana is sort of seen as a commodity of sorts, a mysterious one, almost like a genie's lamp. Gorgeous, can give you everything you want, and yet so elusive and secretive. Yet Diana herself isn't a commodity. She's in a tool or someone that's worth is only put in the value of their marriage. She's really a symbol of what the average person would think of the canoon how the destruction warms its way into someone's life and just sort of breaks them apart. Now, on Bessian and Diana's honeymoon, their lives intersect Jorg's in a way that is most profound, in a way where all their sorrows are highlighted to the max degree. In this tale, there's, there's many different point of views, including the uh the steward of the blood tax who is the first cousin of the prince who rules over the region and it's just such a powerful story however along with it nothing much really happens there's never a climax there's never any action that jorg takes to prevent his upcoming death there's no there's no conclusion to the sadness and destruction of bessian and diana's marriage it's all sort of left at the end of the at the end of the novel. And that's sort of why I'm rating this three out of five stars. Because no matter the prose and no matter how lovely I found the setting, it just wasn't enough to sort of convince me that it was a five star or even a four star rating. And on that note, we'll move on to making our delicious meal. Hey guys, so as I said before, today we are going to be making birek, or Albanian cheese triangles. So in order to form the dough for these Albanian cheese triangles, we are going to need flour first. So I will be adding about a cup and a half of flour to this large bowl I have here. And then after that, I will add the water, olive oil, and a pinch of salt. Once I've done that, we'll move on to the kneading. 
So now that my dough is fully formed, I'm going to place it on this lightly floured surface I have on the countertop. And if you don't like putting flour on your countertops, feel free to just put on some sort of saran wrap or tin foil just to make sure that the dough itself doesn't stick to a countertop. So now that it's here, I will then proceed to knead the dough for about five minutes and then I will place it in this bowl which will be at that point washed and clean and let it rise for 10 minutes. And then we will proceed to make the filling. Great, so now we are ready to make the filling. So what I really like about this recipe too is that all these ingredients are just really common pantry items except for maybe the feta. However, this is really nice because you know when you're making recipes from other countries you sort of expect to go to these like foreign places you know like go to different supermarkets that are 30 miles away which I know for some of you who live in smaller towns is difficult but because all these ingredients are so easy to find, it just makes this recipe a really easy way to sort of explore new foods. So let's get started with the filling. So first, I'm going to start by putting in my feta. And then I'll crack the egg in here. to the side and then I will also add in the milk, the flour, and one tablespoon of olive oil. Once I have all of that mixed together, once you guys do too, we will be ready to move on to our next step. So now that the dough is all proofed and ready to go, we have it on our lightly floured surface again, and we are going to roll it out into a very, very thin 12 inch, well, 12 inch wide by 12 inch long square. And once that happens, we'll be ready to start assembling our uh, triangles. Great, so I have now divided that 12 inch square into four three inch rectangles. So what I'm first going to do is brush this strip with olive oil, and then I'll put two tablespoons of this filling onto, this, onto the rectangle. Once we're finished with that, we'll then continue to do sort of the, making the triangle shape of these birek. Great, so now that we have our strip of dough, we are now going to fold these into little triangles. So what we're first going to do is put a tablespoon of filling sort of near the top, but about an inch from the top and an inch from the right of your uh, pastry dough, I guess. And then you can flatten that out just a little bit, you know, not too much because we're still going to need to fold that. Okay, great, so now that that's a thing, we're going to take the upper left-hand corner and sort of fold it so that it sort of makes a little triangle shape at the top. And you know, mine's not perfect and y'all aren't going to be perfect either. So totally fine if it's just a little bit overfilling. What we're going to do, if that's the case, is just sort of layer it down so that there's sort of another layer of dough protecting that. And we're sort of going to repeat that until all of the strips of dough are just taken up. And now if you're like me and you have sort of little holes where like it's supposed to be and you're afraid it's going to fill out, use a fork and just sort of crimp the tops to ensure that there will be no uh, spillage. <laughs> That's the case. And then you're just going to repeat that about uh, three, three more times. And then we'll be ready to put these bad boys into the oven. Okay guys, so it's been a little bit. I've let the butter cool and here's the final product. Yay, they look lovely. And then let's open them, see what they look like on the inside. Woo! Oh, they look great. They look gorgeous, don't they? Don't they? 
comment if you agree that they look gorgeous in the comments. And if you don't think they look gorgeous, well, comment that anyway. And as always, make sure to like and subscribe, and I'll see y'all next time. Have a lovely day.